Um, so this is a uh, this is a, you know some research that's ongoing and uh, is a culmination of a number of researchers at the Energy Initiative looking at um, energy uh, the role for hydrogen um, across various end use sectors. So uh, I'd like to start by just sort of putting the putting the work in context of you know where we are with respect to energy system and decarbonization. So um, you know the picture has largely been about electric power sector emissions reductions over the last 10 years, driven by the adoption of wind, solar uh, in the electricity sector, as well as significant emissions reductions from coal uh, switching to natural gas. However, if you sort of compare just a picture of emissions reductions in the electricity sector versus other sectors, the picture is relatively bleak because we have seen in many cases emissions uh, remaining flat and in some cases also emissions increasing. So there's also there's been a lot of push to think about um, you know as we are as we are reducing emissions from the electricity sector to take advantage of these declining emissions and to increase the use of electricity in other end use sectors as a proxy for decarbonizing those sectors. So the picture here um, is that you know if you look across the various sectors and look at electricity as a share of final energy across the US as just an example, uh, it stands at about a fifth of final energy use today, with some sectors like residential and commercial seeing much significant, much more uh, higher penetrations of electricity use as compared to sectors like transportation where electricity use is virtually negligible. This picture is likely to evolve as we are, uh, you know, pushing electrification in in sectors like transportation, um, and you know, projections uh, made by the IEA uh, and even in the U.S. context indicate that this uh, this demand for electricity and final energy could grow from a fifth today to about a third going forward uh, by mid-century, primarily resulting from electrification of transportation. However, this does not uh, sort of address the full emissions picture and indicates that, uh, you know, really we are, um, electrification may be limited in in its, uh, in being pursued as a strategy for decarbonization of other end use sectors and technologies, um, you know, for, uh, for decarbonizing sectors where electricity use may be challenging are, are needed. So in this context, you know, hydrogen has a, has a significant role to play and there's been a growing interest in thinking about uh, you know, the role for hydrogen or hydrogen derived uh, energy carriers uh, that can potentially serve in end uses where electricity use may be challenged. And these end uses span sort of the entire economy ranging from, you know, distributed applications like space heating uh, or heavy duty transportation, um, but also for, you know, large scale centralized applications like uh, fuel production for aviation and shipping or chemical production um, and even uh, in the in in case of standalone power generation, as you're thinking about combined heat and power facilities for industrial applications, hydrogen could also sort of play a significant role in deep decarbonization of the power sector, um, primarily as a mechanism for long duration energy storage. So one can imagine as electrolyzers get more uh, cost effective, you could deploy electrolyzers to uh, produce hydrogen at times of excess renewables um, and store that hydrogen. Um, that can subsequently be discharged at times of uh, peak electricity prices or peak grid constraints. Um, so these these applications of hydrogen are, you know, uh, indicate sort of the fact that hydrogen is potentially very versatile and could have multiple end uses. Um, and even in the case of just this power sector example, you could think about integrating this end use application in the power sector with hydrogen use for other applications where some of the hydrogen that is stored could be diverted for end use applications. So the, the main message here is that, um, you know, from our perspective, the as we are thinking about the the role for hydrogen in various applications, such, such as the ones I've highlighted here, um, it is really uh, important to think about it from a holistic perspective and the interaction between these various end users, which will uh, probably have a big impact on the economics of each of these technologies. So that, that's kind of the, the vision for where hydrogen would fit in. But if you sort of compare that vision with where we are today, um, you know, hydrogen is a relatively small share of the energy sector. Um, you know, total demand for hydrogen stands at around eight exajoules, comparing that with even the US primary energy consumption indicates how small a fraction it is. Most of that hydrogen today is used for industrial applications, primarily to produce chemicals like ammonia and methanol, but also to uh, you know, refine crude oil as we are producing fuels. 
moreover the because of the fact that industrial applications are the dominant use of hydrogen today um, the scale of hydrogen infrastructure that we have primarily to move and store hydrogen is is relatively small compared to the the expansive fossil fuel infrastructure that we have so this has implications on where we see opportunities for um, initial adoption of hydrogen in other and other applications if you now just quickly turn to the various production pathways for hydrogen um, you know while there are um, you know there is significant commercial hydrogen production pathways that that have been deployed um, natural gas steam reforming is is the dominant technology um, both in the us and other parts of the world where natural gas is available um, this process is relatively cost effective um, but comes is associated with process co2 emissions of approximately you know 9 kilograms of co2 per kilogram of hydrogen now these process co2 emissions can be reduced by deploying carbon capture uh, at various locations in the process that would increase the overall process cost but can uh, can capture up to 90% of co2 emissions and importantly this technology has been demonstrated at scale and is commercially deployable that said there are other approaches that one could use to further decarbonize natural gas uh, reforming uh, using alternative technology approaches uh, that may be more cost effective down the road so one of the strategies that has been suggested uh, is an approach where you are basically using electrical heating uh, for the steam reforming process uh, that eliminates natural gas combustion um, and essentially takes advantage of the emissions reduction in the electricity sector this approach is um, also potentially consistent with um, making the process more flexible by reducing the thermal mass of the entire uh, uh, reformer uh, system another approach that is being uh, pursued is uh, rel relies on sort of integrating the co2 capture process with the hydrogen production process using membrane reactors uh, and in this particular example from coorstech they're looking at basically um, an intensified strategy that relies on methane and electricity use to produce pure hydrogen and a, a, a sequestration ready co2 product and finally a third approach would rely on sort of methane pyrolysis this approach is still early in its development phase um, and relies on producing a product that is more valuable than co2 from the pyrolysis reaction uh, namely solid carbon that can then potentially have applications in um, you know buildings or other uh, infrastructure type uh, end uses so similar to natural gas based hydrogen production there's also growing interest in pursuing electrolytic hydrogen production particularly as we are seeing the the emissions in the electricity sector come down but also increasingly uh, witnessing periods of zero marginal price grid electricity across various regions so the chart on the right just is an indication of how the electrolysis um, technology deployments are growing both in terms of the size of individual projects but also in terms of just the total number of projects most of these projects um, they are most uh, are in the european context but you're also seeing similar uh, some activity in the us context um and this these uh, these project announcements are you know partly driven by the 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 availability of low carbon and uh, potentially cost effective electricity but also driven by the cost declines in electrolysis particularly for pem systems uh, which are around you know anywhere between 800 to 1000 dollars kilowatt for multi megawatt systems so sort of with this background i would like to just jump in to share some of the insights from our uh, research group uh, that has tried to understand the techno economic impacts uh, and role for hydrogen in various sectors uh, the work i'll be presenting to you is a is a work product of a number of different researchers at the energy initiative um, and involves collaborations with uh, external partners both in industry and academia so the first study uh, that i want to talk about um, it looks at the cost effectiveness of industrial scale hydrogen supply uh, from renewable electrolysis coupled with storage so this is a work that was recently published uh, in cell reports and is primarily motivated by the fact that industrial hydrogen today is the dominant um, use of hydrogen and is an existing demand that could stimulate further um, activity on the technology development particularly around electrolysis pathways so it is important to think about industrial demand from the perspective of what kind of demand it is so uh 
industrial demand is characterized primarily by steady hydrogen consumption uh, at centralized facilities. Uh, historically, this, this type of demand has been supplied by uh, co-located uh, hydrogen production facilities, primarily relying on natural gas steam methane reforming. Um, the chart on the left is just showing you, an as an example, the various locations for existing hydrogen production in the US context. And uh, these, these sites uh, are, uh, the size of the circles are indicative of the annual CO2 emissions, which is roughly proportional to the amount of hydrogen that would, these facilities would be producing. Um, so one can, one can basically use these facilities as a proxy to understand locations of hydrogen demand in the US. Um, as we think about decarbonization of the industrial sector, um, you know, estimates made by the National Renewable Energy Lab indicate that the demand for hydrogen could increase by up to fivefold uh, as we think about hydrogen penetration in the metals industry for producing um, for expanded ammonia production, as well as in, in use uh, in displacing natural gas heating in many instances uh, for fuels production and chemicals production. So our motivation in this study was to primarily understand, you know, what is the cost and emissions outlook for electrolytic hydrogen to serve this industrial demand, which is already present. So one approach to serve this continuous um, and centralized demand for hydrogen would be to uh, deploy electrolysis in conjunction with electricity imported from the grid. So when you're thinking about grid electrolysis systems that are running uh, that, that involve the electrolyzer operating 24 seven, the levelized cost of hydrogen, which is uh, shown in the right, uh, is dominated entirely by the cost of electricity with the capital cost of, uh, of the electrolyzer sort of contributing a very small amount to the levelized cost. So to illustrate this point, uh, what I'm showing you here is a calculation illustrating the levelized hydrogen cost across different locations in the California um, independent system operator wholesale uh, electricity market uh, as a function of two different electrolyzer cost scenarios, as well as different historical electricity prices across these various locations. So the, the two main messages here are that, you know, if you compare the panel on the left with the panel on the right, where the panel on the left is, uh, is estimating costs based on current electrolyzer capex um, versus future electrolyzer capital costs, you see that there are small differences across these two panels, indicating the point that the cost of electricity dominates the cost of grid electrolysis when you're operating the electrolyzer 24 seven. The other point to note here is that, you know, the range of electrolysis, the, the levelized hydrogen costs for these systems are in, um, are in the order of two to $3 a kilogram and vary significantly depending on, um, you know, the historical electricity price patterns, which are largely influenced by natural gas prices. So if you think about sort of the emissions impact of grid electrolysis, um, it's worth looking at uh, for the same region, the grid emissions intensity over the past uh, 10 years or so. Um, and California has been sort of on the leading edge of renewables penetration, at least in the US context. And we have seen significant reductions in emissions intensity um, going from you know 300 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour all the way to closer to 200 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Uh, still, if you take the emissions intensity of the current grid uh, and account for the efficiency losses in the electrolysis process, um, you end up with a hydrogen product that has higher emissions intensity than natural gas steam methane reforming uh, directly. So this indicates that basically, um, you know, grid electrolysis, while potentially an appealing strategy today, um, may not yield the same em emissions benefits uh, and would need sort of further reductions in um, emissions on the electricity system to be more cost effective than even natural gas steam methane reforming um, and also to be in more environmentally beneficial. So our approach was to sort of think about, uh, you know, what, what would it take to basically have a renewables electrolysis uh, based hydrogen supply for industrial applications with the important caveat that industrial applications typically demand continuous supply of hydrogen. Uh, whereas, you know, renewable electricity uh, and renewable resources uh, exhibit variability over multiple timescales. So consider a facility shown here where we have a PV um, 
PV uh, PV array that that could supply electricity when available to operate an electrolyzer, um, and that could produce hydrogen for the industrial offtaker. But to manage the variability in PV availability and to ensure continuous supply of hydrogen, uh, one really needs to factor in the need for energy storage, either in the form of electricity storage or in the form of hydrogen downstream of the electrolyzer that can then be discharged to supply hydrogen at times of um, you know, uh, no PV availability. So if you think about a system like this, um, you know, that really has no, um, uh, that has very small operating costs, uh, it's important to think about the economics of the system while factoring the possible design options that are available in terms of the relative sizing of these various units, because ultimately the capital costs of such a system dominate the overall levelized cost of hydrogen production. So our approach uh, to sort of think about the economics of the system was to formulate basically an integrated design and operations optimization problem uh, that basically tries to minimize the capital costs and the operating costs of this entire system uh, subject to uh, a number of constraints that stipulate the hourly production requirements of the system um, while also ensuring that they are available at the same availability levels as a typical natural gas facility um, and including constraints regarding the flexibility and operability of uh, the various unit operations uh, involved here. So using this, uh, using this optimization approach where we look at the operations of the plant uh, over the entire year, so at an hourly resolution, um, we looked at the economics of PV-based uh, electrolytic hydrogen supply for industrial applications across 1,500 locations in the US, uh, where we are characterizing the PV resource uh, based on a single access oriented tracking system. So here I'm showing you uh, just the snapshots for uh, the, the model outcomes for uh, the 2030 cost scenario that we defined uh, in this analysis, which looks at electrolysis cost projections approaching $300 a kilowatt and uh, PV capital costs in the range of $500 a kilowatt. So the chart on the left is basically demonstrating to you uh, two, two key design parameters as a function of the different locations, which are characterized by the average PV capacity factor across those locations. So if you focus on the chart on the top, uh, you see that uh, across the various locations that we have analyzed, it's always cost effective to oversize your PV capacity compared to your electrolyzer capacity, uh, almost by a factor of uh, two uh, in many instances. And the main reason for this is that, um, you know, peak PV availability in the system occurs only at, um, you know, for a few hundred hours in the year. So in order to improve the electrolyzer cap capacity utilization and improve the overall economics of the process, uh, sizing your electrolyzer to be smaller than your PV system turns out to be very cost effective. Uh, the panel on the bottom shows you the required energy storage capacity in terms of hours of nameplate production capacity uh, as a function of the average PV capacity factor. And so not surprisingly, as you're moving to locations with higher PV resource, the storage requirements are significantly decreasing, uh, noting that this is a log plot on the y-axis. Even at the best locations now, um, you see that you know, your hydrogen storage requirements can, can vary quite a bit from location to location, uh, varying as much by a factor of two if you're looking at locations that have PV capacity factors about 25%. One of the reasons for this is that, you know, you see seasonal variations in PV availability across locations that are not captured in the average PV capacity factor metric. So if you just look at the um, monthly PV capacity factor for the two locations that have the lowest and highest storage requirements uh, that are shown here, um, the line uh, corresponding to the purple line is indicative of the location with the lowest storage requirements. And you see that that, re that particular location has much lower variation in monthly PV capacity factors across the year uh, as compared to the location that has higher storage requirements. And this then translates into looking at the storage inventory levels, which varies much more significantly for the, the more uh, the, for the location that has greater seasonal variability in PV availability. So, that, so the, the key takeaway here is as we're thinking about these renewables dominated uh, production processes, it's really important to account for increased temporal resolution at both the hourly level, but also sort of ac accounting for the seasonal variations in these resources.
if you put all of this together now you can start to get a picture of what we uh, you know what what would be the levelized hydrogen production costs um, across uh, the various locations in the us for different scenarios and here i'm just showing you the example of the 2030 scenario where we see the potential for you know costs varying um, by as much as one order of magnitude across the entire us but notably um, on this map, I'm highlighting uh, the blue locations, which are corresponding to the lower cost locations, um, and overlaid on which you're also uh, noting the locations for existing hydrogen production. And you see sort of good overlap in um, in the the, rel uh, the relatively cheaper hydrogen production sites, as well as existing demand for hydrogen uh, in regions like the Gulf Coast, as well as in California, which could be indicative of, of near-term deployment opportunities. So one, one uh, point to note here is if we sort of just focus on um, the levelized hydrogen cost at the top 10 uh, PV resource sites with existing hydrogen demand, since they could be potentially near-term deployment uh, locations, uh, it's worth thinking about what is making up the overall levelized hydrogen cost. And so in systems where you're sort of sourcing all of your electricity from co-located PV, it's not surprising to see that the capital costs of PV dominate the entire uh, cost of the overall system, followed by uh, cost contributions from electrolyzer capital costs. Um, but what is interesting to also see is that across locations, again, that have very similar average PV capacity factors, uh, you see that there could be large differences in the overall levelized costs, depending on the amount of overbuilding of PV you need to do in this case to be able to manage the variability in the resource over different time scales. Now, of course, uh, you know I've, I've shown you results for um, you know one particular cost scenario. There is significant uncertainty about the capital cost of electrolyzers, so it's worth exploring how the levelized cost of hydrogen could could change as a function of electrolyzer capital costs. Um, and so if you see here for those 10 locations on the previous chart, I'm plotting basically the levelized hydrogen costs. And generally speaking, you know, one, one would need to see lower level, uh, lower electrolyzer capital cost than what we are, uh, than what we have today, uh, you know, in the range of $500 a kilowatt or lower to be able to get into the range of costs for natural gas-based hydrogen production with CCS. Now, one thing that could change this picture is uh, the availability of geological hydrogen storage, which is much cheaper um, on, a, on a capital cost basis, uh, and but however is limited in its geographical availability. Um, so availability of cheap storage significantly reduces, um, you know, the threshold um, cost reduction for electrolysis that would make it competitive with natural gas reforming with CCS, for example. And it's worth pointing out that geological hydrogen storage is something that is practiced at scale today. Um, you know, at five locations, two of them actually in Texas. So this is a technology that is available, but maybe limited in geographical availability. So I'd like to quickly pivot to a second case study that highlights uh, the more integrated and multi-sector nature of hydrogen um, use in future energy systems. So the prior study basically looked at a dedicated application for industrial uh, for industrial consumers, um, which which is a demand that exists today and could be a, an opportunity for near-term deployment. However, as we think about more distributed nature of um, hydrogen use in sectors like transportation and in buildings. Um, you have to really think about the value proposition of hydrogen in conjunction with um, the use in both these sectors, but also um, its competition with other energy carriers that could be serving these sectors, which could be electricity, which could also be natural gas as it is today in many of these applications. So thinking about the, the multiple uh, end uses where hydrogen could play a role and the holistic value proposition that hydrogen might provide could help us answer you know, some interesting questions regarding the long-term decarbonization pathways about these questions, uh, about these sectors. So for example, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the questions that I think is particularly relevant in the US context is around the role for natural gas across the various sectors, whether in electricity production or in for producing hydrogen. Um, another um, interesting point that, that can come out from analyzing the energy system in an integrated way is to understand how sector coupling influences least cost infrastructure outcomes and what implications it might have on overall resiliency of these systems. Um, and also, uh, as we think about you know, decarbonization of all of these end uses, direct or indirect electrification via the use of hydrogen um, are important factors to consider. <laughs> 
so uh, we have sort of embarked on on looking into this this particular uh, aspect by first considering sort of electricity hydrogen infrastructure interactions in the context of hydrogen use in the power and transportation sectors so um, you know our approach here is to basically formulate a least cost infrastructure planning optimization problem uh, with high temporal resolution of operations of the power system as well as the hydrogen supply chain uh, in our initial attempt we have basically parameterized the availability of gas infrastructure as well as co2 infrastructure that would be relevant if you are looking at carbon capture and sequestration pathways in both these sectors um, our uh, optimization approach basically tries to minimize the capital and operating costs of the system uh, to meet demand in both the power sector as well as in the transportation sector while accounting for you know supply demand constraints at an hourly resolution as well as technology constraints that uh, you know um, that that limit operational flexibility of various technologies and considering a range of policy scenarios uh, with increasing carbon prices so the key outputs that you get from a framework like this uh, point to basically investments in in various technologies across the power and hydrogen supply chains as well as their utilization and interaction um, through the linkages of using power to produce hydrogen as well as the use of hydrogen to balance uh, power supply in the electricity system so uh, here i'll highlight one case study that we have looked at um, and are in the process of submitting for peer review um, so this is a case study where we looked at um, the us northeast and potential penetration of hydrogen in the transportation sector for both light duty and heavy duty vehicles um, with 20% of uh, fuel cell electric vehicle penetration across both modes so our our, uh, our framework sort of think uh, looks at uh, representing the us northeast with six zones with interactions with canada uh, accounting for the hydropower that is imported from from those regions uh, we have a range of energy range of technologies across the power and hydrogen supply chain um, you know looking at production of electricity as well as hydrogen but also looking at different transportation modes of hydrogen namely in the form of pipelines or trucks which are an interesting option because they allow for um, you know a scale up of hydrogen infrastructure without significant capital investment and also can serve as mobile and stationary hydrogen storage um, at the same time our representation of system operations is based on uh, sampling 30 representative weeks from historical weather um, and including weeks where you have particularly extreme conditions in terms of renewables availability there are a number of assumptions that go into a model like this uh, so i'll just highlight two of them so we are using um, you know our, our annual hydrogen demand and the scenarios that we are considering are based on a million tons of year of hydrogen consumption in the transportation sector um, as well as we're using data from the nrel electrification future study to look at um, you know the prospect that the future uh, demand for electricity across all sectors will generally increase beyond current levels so what i'm showing you here uh, is a breakdown of the model or model outcomes for a, for for a range of scenarios defined by electrolyzer capital costs and carbon prices ranging from 0 to 1000 dollars per ton of uh, co2 um, so the, the plot here is basically showing you a breakdown of the hydrogen generation capacity uh, by technology type for the combination of these two uh, scenario parameters so what you see is that under in the absence of a carbon price uh, and you know in the range of where we see uh, near term costs for electrolysis um, there's really you know it's hard to compete against natural gas based reforming in terms of hydrogen production however even with a small carbon price and some reductions in electrolysis costs you start to see significant penetration of electrolysis for hydrogen production um, but you also see carbon capture and sequestration coupled with natural gas reforming playing a significant role in in terms of hydrogen generation as we look at the electricity system um, that is simultaneously co-optimized with the hydrogen system uh, we see that increasing renewables uh, penetration is is uh, accompanied as you're increasing carbon prices which is not surprising um, and more importantly what, what one of the interesting sort of findings from this analysis is that carbon capture uh, in in a system like this is preferentially preferred at lower carbon prices in the hydrogen system compared to the electricity system now part of this is driven by the fact that um, adoption of um, electrolysis in the hydrogen generation system essentially creates a large flexible demand that supports renewables penetration which makes carbon capture less attractive in the electricity system and more attractive in the hydrogen production um, sector 
So if you now think about the need for storage in these types of systems as you're balancing the variability of renewables uh, uh, for producing electricity and hydrogen, um, the, the plot I'm showing you here basically shows you the energy capacity in gigawatt hours of, uh, of, uh, of storage across the two sectors broken down um, you know, by the various scenario combinations here. So the, the sort of the key takeaway here is that as you're, in, as you're integrating um, electricity use for hydrogen production, um, the predominant form of energy storage is, is in the form of mobile and stationary hydrogen storage that, that uh, basically dominates electrochemical storage in the electricity sector. Um, and, and not only that, you also see that a lot of the hydrogen storage is in the form of mobile storage where trucks essentially provide a cost-effective way to balancing variability over multiple time scales, but also balancing variability across the, the spatial distribution of a given region. So because of the ability to move uh, hydrogen across these regions using trucks, you're able to actually um, exploit the, the flexibility that trucks provide in balancing the overall system. And that makes it very attractive to think about truck deployment for hydrogen transport. Another point um, that is interesting to look at in, in the context of our framework is to understand what are the benefits of sector coupling. So when I, when I refer to sector coupling, it is basically the interaction between the power system and the hydrogen supply chain system through these two links, the power to, hyd power to hydrogen link and the, the use of hydrogen for balancing the electricity system. So uh, the results I've shown you uh, are based on this coupled approach where you're looking at the co-optimization of both these systems, but one could, um, as just a counterfactual experiment, look at the the evolution of both these systems in, in the decoupled scenario and compare the outcomes between the decoupled scenario and the coupled scenario to understand the benefits of sector coupling. So the plot here is basically showing you the change in the power system capacity as a result of sector coupling, where a positive value indicates that you're deploying more of a particular technology um, in, on the generation side um, in, the, in the coupled approach as compared to the decoupled approach. Um, and so what you see here is that as you're uh, with sector coupling, you're essentially getting a preferential adoption of renewables uh, at the expense of dispatchable generation, uh, primarily uh, in the form of natural gas-based power generation and some, uh, some reduction in power capacity of lithium ion batteries that are deployed in the power sector. And the main reason for this is the fact that the the creation of an external demand for um, power for hydrogen production via electrolysis coupled with hydrogen storage in the hydrogen sector essentially creates demand flexibility that obviates the need for uh, dispatchable generation sources to balance renewables and in fact is synergistic to the extent that it, it leads to more renewables deployment uh, in the electricity system. So just to highlight this point, uh, here I'm showing you basically the dispatch of the power system and the hydrogen system across the entire uh, across the entire region uh, for one representative week in our model, um, where we have significant electrolyzer deployment because of the low capital cost scenario we're considering here. So you see in the bottom here the electrolyzer, which is shown in the green, tends to produce uh, primarily when you have excessive renewables supply uh, indicated here by excessive wind availability. Um, and in the absence of uh, renewables availability, you effectively see uh, natural gas based hydrogen production in this case with CCS uh, providing some of the capacity for uh, hydrogen while uh, in the electricity system, you basically see some dispatchable generations making up for the lack of renewables in these systems. Um, and you see significantly the role that trucks can play essentially to balance the system across these two um, sectors. So one final point I want to highlight here from, from, from this coupled approach, uh, it allows us to think about uh, the interactions between production and distribution technologies uh, for hydrogen and how they are uh, related with each other um, and what benefits that they might provide in, in future scenarios. So here I'm showing you basically um, uh, the plot of how much hydrogen is transported across the entire uh, region on an annual basis as a function of uh, three parameters. Uh, the percentages are indications of uh, pipeline capital costs. Um, and we're looking at sort of two distinct scenarios. 
one scenario is a scenario where electrolysis is an expensive technology um, and you don't have a carbon price. So the dominant mode of hydrogen production is natural gas reforming. Uh, and another set of scenarios are where electrolysis is relatively cheap technology and you have a carbon price. Um, and so electrolysis supplies most of the hydrogen. So when you sort of compare the height of these bars, um, you get to, you, uh, you see that uh, hydrogen um, distribution uh, tends to be uh, the, the, the sort of the network that you deploy when you have natural gas reforming is largely a centralized network where you're having to transport a lot more hydrogen between locations compared to a system where you have electrolysis as your primary um, production technology where essentially you can co-locate electrolysis near demand and reduce the amount of hydrogen that you're transporting across these systems. Another factor here is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, most of the hydrogen that is being transported in, in, our, in our default scenarios um, are driven by uh, truck-based transportation given the high cost of pipelines. But you do see that you know, at a certain tipping point in pipeline costs, you can significantly switch to um, pipeline-based hydrogen transport, which will turn out to be more cost-effective. Um, now, this could be new hydrogen pipelines that you're deploying, or this could also be indicative of the cost retrofit um, thresholds uh, associated with retrofitting existing natural gas pipelines to be able to transport hydrogen across different regions. So this kind of highlights how the, the choice of hydrogen transportation infrastructure is intricately tied to the choice of production technologies that are deployed for hydrogen. So I'd like to just conclude by uh, briefly talking a little bit about uh, you know, some of the key takeaways from our work. And as, as I mentioned, this is much of this work is ongoing and we're looking at a number of different extensions to look at hydrogen use in multiple different sectors, as well as um, you know, it, its uh, implications for overall system resiliency. So for the case studies that I showed you, uh, you know, the industrial decarbonization case study is interesting in the sense that it, it is trying to look at a, a centralized use for hydrogen that already exists today and could pave the way for large scale deployment of electrolyzers and bring down their costs for other applications. And here we see that as we're thinking about these renewables uh, driven processes in general, um, you know, the sizing of these units become an important factor. And if you have geological hydrogen storage, it opens up the pathway for um, potentially cost competitive hydrogen with natural gas, SMR with CCS. On the sector coupling element, you know, we see a, we see a sort of a big, big driver for natural gas use, not so much in the power sector, but in the hydrogen sector where it could play a role for even under moderate to high CO2 prices and low electrolyzer cost scenarios for supplying hydrogen. Um, and the flexibility that electrolysis provides coupled with hydrogen storage enables increased renewables penetration in the power sector that could um, have an impact on the no role for electrochemical storage as well as dispatchable generation in the, in the electricity sector. And finally, the point about hydrogen transportation infrastructure and its interactions with, the with production infrastructure implies that you really can't be thinking about these, these infrastructure choices independently, but have to think about these interactions in a holistic way. So I, I, I wanna stop here and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much for your time.